Hello and welcome to Grace Lutheran Church Sermon Podcasts. On this podcast, you will hear the latest sermons taken from our weekly worship service. Our hope is that you will find joy and comfort in knowing the forgiveness of God through Jesus Christ. Morning, it is November 20th. It is the second Sunday before the um, beginning of Advent, already late in the year. Our text for today is Colossians 1, verses 13 to 20. Have you ever been transferred? People get transferred or relocated due to their work from time to time. The transfer can be a good thing or a bad thing. It could have its drawbacks. Sometimes it's a bit of a mixed bag. You know, when players are transferred from the Giants or the 49ers or the Warriors, on the downside, the town, the city, is without its heroes. And the teams they now play for might not be that great. But on the upside, for these guys, they probably will have cheaper housing and cost of living and taxes if they've gone out of state. There's always a downside, and there's always an upside when transferring. That is not the case with the transfer that you and I experience as Christians. This kind of transfer is always good. Even the stuff that seems to be bad at the time turns out to be for our ultimate good. The transfer I'm talking about is the one described in our reading today from Colossians, namely that God has delivered us from the domain of darkness, transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son. Transferred to the kingdom of his Son. This morning, we'll look at this as we anticipate the second coming of Christ during our Advent season. First, the domain that we've been delivered from, And second, the domain, the kingdom that we've been transferred to. And the third, the son, whose kingdom it is. First, what domain have we been delivered? St. Paul describes it as domain of darkness. That this is what God has delivered us from. And that God, and thank God that he has. For this is a domain from which we could not rescue or deliver ourselves. The domain of darkness describes the lost condition and state in which we were born and were stuck and would remain if not for God's rescue. The domain of darkness is a domain of doom and death. It's the devil's domain where he deceives and entices us into being our own gods, independent of and rebelling against the will of our true creator. We all too easily go along with him. The domain of darkness, the world is lost in the darkness of sin and unbelief. The people of this world are groping around in the dark, unable to find their way to God. They know that there must be a God or gods up there somewhere. They can observe from nature that there must be a God, and all of this could not have come about by pure accident. Even scientists today that have held on to evolutionary theory are turning to recognize that there must be an intelligent design somewhere behind it. They can identify and examine the parts of nature or science, but they can't put it together. Their reason tells them that there there must be a creator who is behind all of this. They feel in their consciences as well that there is a standard of right and wrong. This is the law of God written in human hearts, as Jeremiah says. That there is a God to whom we are accountable and that somehow things are not right between us and God. The question, though, is, the questions are, who is this God? How does he regard us and how do we get right with him? How do we solve the death problem? These are the questions that the people of this world have no answers for. Not the right answers, anyway. They're just groping around in the dark, guessing, grasping at straws, making things up as they go along. The domain of darkness, it's a bad place to be. And you and I would still be there if God had not intervened. He undertook the big rescue mission, if you will. It involved sending his own son into this hall of death, this domain of doom and gloom and darkness. And Jesus took on the devil on his own turf. At least the devil thought it was his own turf, and it really isn't, but it was under his temporary sway anyway. 
like Pharaoh enslaving the Israelites. So Satan held us in slavery and bondage, thinking that we truly belong to him. But also like Pharaoh, Satan was about to get knocked down to size. And so Christ came doing the big rescue job, born as our brother, sharing our humanity. The very Son of God came down from heaven for us, men and women, and for our salvation. The devil went after him from the get-go, trying to kill him, entice him, deceive him, make him doubt, make him weak, along with the other boys of Bethlehem, and it didn't work. The devil went after him again and again at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, right after his baptism in the Jordan. He tempted Jesus, if you'll remember, in the wilderness, just like he tempted Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden and the Israelites in the wilderness when they complained to Moses. But again, it didn't work. Jesus withstood the temptations, and Jesus then went on the offense driving out demons and healing diseases and fulfilling the law and making the prophecies come true and forgiving sins and unmasking hypocrisy and teaching the truth and establishing justice. This did work, and it worked beautifully, but Satan hadn't given up. He'd give it one more try. Yeah, get someone to betray Jesus. Hand him over and get him railroaded into a shameful, humiliating crucifixion Ah, uh, Satan, this time you've won. Uh, maybe not. Satan is stupid when compared to God. Even this crucifixion was part of God's rescue plan. But it looked good at the time. It looked good like the domain of darkness was winning. Indeed, darkness came over the land. The mockers mocked. And Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But as I say... This was God's rescue plan, his daring and dramatic rescue plan put into action. It was the only way for humanity to be rescued, to be delivered. The price, the penalty for sin had to be paid, and we couldn't pay it. We're not righteous enough. Our sacrifice wouldn't amount to a hill of beans. But Christ's death does measure up, and then some. For he is the very Son of God, able to pay the full price for all persons who have ever lived He's the holy righteous one, the sinless one, who kept God's law in perfect righteousness and lived as the true creation that God the Father intended for everyone. His death, his blood, has infinite worth. And so this rescue, this deliverance, did work. It is finished, Christ cries out. Tetelestai, meaning nothing more is needed. Mission accomplished. Big time. The resurrection shows forth the victory. Death is overcome. The death problem is solved. God and man back together. The way it ought to be. Peace, reconciliation, forgiveness. All accomplished in the cross of Christ. Life, new life, eternal life. Springing forth from an empty tomb. And this is for you. You have been delivered from the domain of darkness. No more are you groping around in the dark. As a Christian, you know who God is, the true God, the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You know how God regards you in mercy. He loves you with an everlasting love. You know how you are put right with God, not through your own works, which could never suffice, but through the saving work of Christ for you on your behalf. And you'll know the answer to the death problem. It is quite simply Jesus Christ himself. Through faith in him, you are removed from death to life. God has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Here's the big transfer, and it's all good. You have been transferred, relocated to the kingdom of God's beloved son. This is Christ's kingdom the one he came to establish at his baptism and again at his transfiguration. God declared about Jesus, this is my beloved son. And so he is. In this kingdom, we have redemption. Redemption is a word of liberation and freedom. Redemption means release from a state of bondage by means of a payment being paid to set the person free. And that payment was the blood of Christ, which is all sufficient, all cleansing. 
And in the kingdom of Christ, we have the forgiveness of sins. Forgiveness means that our sins have been removed from us as far as the east is from the west. God has sent them away, lifted them off of our shoulders. He doesn't hold those sins against us, for Christ is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. It's not here anymore. God has transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption for the forgiveness of sins, Colossians says. Luther summed it up like this in his explanation to the second article of the Creed. I believe that Jesus Christ, true God, begotten of the Father from all eternity, and also true man, born of the Virgin Mary, is my Lord, who has redeemed me, a lost and condemned person, purchased and won me from all sins, from death and from the power of the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his holy precious blood and with his innocent suffering and death, that I may be his own and live under him in his kingdom and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness, just as he is risen from the dead, lives and reigns to all eternity. This is most certainly true. And this is most certainly good news for you. Living under Christ in his kingdom forever, this is the great transfer we will go to enjoy for eternity. And we rejoice even now, living in this kingdom. So now Paul, in the rest of his passage in Colossians, tells us more about who this Son of God is, into whose kingdom we've been transferred. And this part of Colossians is often called the Christ hymn, because it looks like it may have been a very early poetic hymn of praise to Christ used in the church. It goes like this, he, meaning Christ, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Take it in. Drink it in. Look at who it is who has rescued us. Look at who it is, the king in this kingdom to which we belong, the eternal Son of God, second person of the Trinity, by whom all things were created, the one who holds all authority in heaven and on earth. The one who is, is, is the head of his body, the church. Yes, it's the risen and ascended Lord Jesus Christ who right now is ruling all things for the sake of his church. And that's you and me. He is the beginning of the resurrection of the dead. Meaning that you too are going to rise on the day when Christ returns. He is the God-man Savior, both true God and true man, all-powerful and, at the same time, our sympathetic, empathetic, merciful brother. Jesus Christ, through him, God has reconciled all things to himself, making peace by the blood of his cross. This great gospel of Christ, who he is, namely the very Son of God and what God has done for us through him, delivering us from the domain of darkness, transferring us to the kingdom of his beloved Son. This gospel will sustain you to the end, through all adversities, trials, and obstacles. And this gospel, which even now fills you with hope and confidence, will carry you on into the age to come, in the kingdom of God's Son whom we await for now during this Advent season. Amen. To know more about Jesus and our ministry at Grace Lutheran Church, please find us at www.gracealoneonline.org. You'll find additional sermon podcasts and your favorite podcast channel every week at www.gracealoneonline.org forward slash sermons.